Yeah? Ah, great. Goedemiddag allemaal. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Berber van der Woude. Welcome to this uh, event at uh, Pakhuis de Zwijger. Uh, we're fully, uh, how do you call it, fully booked. Uh, so uh, it's a very, it's a very good, uh, good day to, uh, to have you here. Um, um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we have a very uh, interesting lineup. I'm very, very happy, though it would have been so much greater to have you here physically, to uh, welcome Dr. Hassan Abusita, who will be joining us from Glasgow. Are you in Glasgow, Hassan? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> he's still there. <laughs> I will introduce you properly later, but it's very nice to have you here. Um, we will have a, a session of about two hours with two themes. Of course, the destruction of the healthcare system uh, and the humanitarian disaster in, uh, in Gaza and the suppression of Palestinian solidarity in Europe. Um, and in between those two, we will have a very nice intermezzo by uh, Sobhi Khatib, our storyteller. Very excited to have a bit of air in two very difficult uh, topics. Um, just before we begin, uh, I would like to have establish some, I'm not a big fan of rules, but at least ways to make this session uh, as enjoyable as possible, or uh, enjoyable might not be the good word, but as um, acceptable <laughs> uh, as possible. Uh, we will do a round of questions at the end of the session, so please hold back. Um, and then also, if you, uh, if you want to intervene, make it a question and not a statement. The statement uh, is for the people who are, will be invited on the, on, the, on the podium, on the stage. Um, well, and if you intervene, um, I would like to ask you to, um, yeah, to do it respectfully. Um, the rule is uh, hating is leaving, so there's no place for racism, anti-Semitism, misogynism, transphobia, uh, whatever kind of hate. And uh, uh, I will be quite strict on that. And um, yeah, hating is leaving. We have two people from the security, Hamdi and Peter, in the back. Uh, and they will be very helpful <laughs> if things get rough. I'm watching you. <laughs> okay, uh, my last uh, uh, remark is this type of event sometimes is, uh, well, uh, talking about hate, is being infiltrated by people that have, uh, that not always come with good intentions. It happens. Uh, we have nothing to be ashamed of. This is a topic we should discuss. Um, and, uh, well, if you feel unsafe or if you feel unpleasant uh, because someone behaves in a way that you think, hmm, this, does, this is not right. Uh, yeah, just uh, give someone a sign. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> I was thinking maybe Michi or something, but we have Hamdi and Peter then as well. Uh, <laughs> they are very important for this session. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that will be, I think, the way to make this, uh, this afternoon together as, uh, yeah, as good as possible and uh, as uh, uh, rewarding as possible as well. Now, without further ado, I would like to go to the first panel and I would like to invite, uh, well, my first uh, guest on stage. That's, that's uh, Sara Gali. Uh, Sara is an anesthesiologist in The Hague. Uh, she is uh, um, working for, well, basically not working for as a, uh, but doing a lot of work for Artsen for Gaza, Doctors for Gaza. Their aim is to, um, yeah, to, um, to, make an, uh, to end the violence and protect the, to promote the protection of healthcare workers, to promote the access of emergency aid and emergency uh, medical workers to Gaza, and she's focusing mainly on the, uh, on the, on the Dutch uh, situation, of course. Uh, can, I give, uh, can I get a big applause for uh, Sarah Gali?
Well, and then our, uh, yeah, our guest of honor, I may say, uh, Hassan Abusita. <laughs> There he is. Hassan is a plastic and reconstructive uh, surgeon. He's Palestinian-British, and he's also director of the University of Glasgow. Uh, he's been working in several war zones, Yemen, Syria, South Lebanon, and also Gaza in previous, uh, uh, yeah, with, uh, during previous uh, uh, rounds of Israeli attacks and uh, violence. On the 9th of October, he went to uh, Gaza uh, to work for 43 days in a row, day and night. Uh, he worked, amongst others, in uh, Al-Shifa and Al-Ahli hospitals. Uh, and he was, he is also uh, going to, of being, uh, having a role as a, uh, doing a testimony for the International Criminal Court. Um, He got a Schengen ban uh, when he tried to enter uh, Berlin uh, for the Palestine, uh, Palestine uh, Congress there. Uh, we managed, well, they managed with a lot of uh, uh, legal work to get the ban lifted, but unfortunately other restrictions kept him again uh, far from us, but he will be here uh, virtually and I'm very honored to welcome Hassan, Dr. Hassan Abusita. Dr. Abusita, or may I say Hassan? Yes. yes. Okay. Hello. Thank you so much. Welcome in, uh, well, in Amsterdam. <laughs> um, I was, uh, yeah, the first thing I would like to ask you is you decided to travel to Gaza immediately after uh, the Israeli, well, basically destruction of Gaza uh, began. What was your, like, what was your cue to go there? So, um, my, I think, like a lot of people, by the end of the, the day of the 7th of October, I'd come to the realization that we were going to face a major assault on Gaza. At that time, having been in Gaza during the 2014 war, I felt that it probably was going to be a worse version of, of the 2014 war, but nothing like what I had seen. And previous experiences in Gaza and in previous wars have always taught me that, that, that borders are the biggest manifestation of bureaucratic momentum. And so you can always get in in the first 24 to 48 hours before the messages come from the center to the border crossing to shut down or stop people entering. And so I felt that, that I probably had until uh, midday uh, Monday to go in before things really, the shutters came down. And that was very true. I mean, I was in Gaza on the uh, 11 o'clock on the Monday morning, and the Israelis bombed the, 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 the crossing at uh, around one o'clock. And so that was the decision that I kind of, the reason why I went in, because I felt that, and I was right, the first outside team came in only uh, in towards the end of November, December, when there was the first ceasefire. So that was a very good call. And also, you were immediately locked in then, basically, there. So can Absolutely. you tell us a little bit about, because for us, it's been a lot of, well, many of us have seen uh, images of what happened uh, on, on our t TV and phone screens. But can you give us a description of what you saw? Because you were really there in the middle of it. So uh, on the first day, Monday, we were uh, we were uh, pinned down in a house for that night there were the night of of monday the um, the ninth there were 350 air raids on gaza city and i didn't make it into shifa hospital until the tuesday morning when i i walked to shifa hospital from where i was staying and it was at tuesday when i started to go around and see the patients with my colleagues in the burns unit it became apparent that even by Tuesday, two or three days on, the hospital had already become almost full. And what was also quite disturbing is that as a result of the siege that had been imposed on Gaza for over 16 years, 
the health system was already short of a lot of very basic things. Uh, uh, I recall the first patient uh, going to see was a, a teenage girl that had around 60, 70% burns uh, uh, as a surface area of her body. And we didn't have the disinfectant that we need to clean the burns to stop them from becoming infected. And we ended up cleaning her with regular soap. And that kind of set the tone for a system that was already on its knees when the war started. And then what happened was just a tsunami of injury. The whole of, of Gaza Strip had 2,500 beds going into this war. But by the end of the first second week, there were around 6,500 wounded. And so it kind of shows you how very quickly the system was completely submerged and unable to cope just with the sheer number of the wounded because of the bombing that was happening. And this is before the 17th of October, when the program to destroy the health system began. So even before the 17th of October, the numbers exceeded the capacity of the system to treat them. And um, because you've been to Gaza also with previous rounds of, uh, of, of, of violence, this was really different, right? Can you, can you tell us in what way it was so different? I think the difference is the difference between a, a flood and a tsunami. And, 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 and the flood includes my time in Mosul, my time in Damascus, uh, the 2014 war, the 2009 war. Uh, it's just to give you a kind of example of the scale, I would operate from eight o'clock in the morning to around one o'clock the following morning. And so I would manage to do between eight and 12 surgeries that day. But in that time, the ambulances were coming every minute or two to Shifa Hospital, each ambulance with four or five wounded. And so whatever you were doing was such an infinitesimally small part of the sheer magnitude of what you were facing. And so by the beginning of the first week, by the middle of the first week, just as a small department, because plastic surgery is a small department in Shifa, as a small department, we'd already had 120 patients waiting to go to the operating room that had not been operated on and had exceeded the time limit where clinically you should be operating on these patients. How did you how did you cope? Because of course you're you're used to horrible scenes and to working under pressure, but it must have been very 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 heavy for you as well, right? Your family is also uh, from Gaza, right? So it also touched you in the heart, I imagine. How did you cope with that? I think during the day you're so overwhelmed by the need to get one patient off the table, get the other patient on the table trying to kind of organize the, 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 the team uh, and work with the team that you're working with so that you can optimize the number of people who are active at any time because, you know, there are times when I would be in the burns unit operating so that my colleague would go to the other operating rooms and work with some of the other surgeons and other specialties. And so you kind of, you're, you're, you're so busy during the day that the day goes by very quickly, but there are moments which take you aback when you hear, you, usually it's not the kind of injury, it's, it's the stories of people and, and their lives and the way their lives have been shattered, not just their bodies have been broken. And, and, and or when you go to the emergency department uh, uh, and, and you see the horror in people's faces as they're looking for their loved ones. And sometimes that horror is in the faces of your colleagues because they've heard that there was an air raid on their neighborhood and they're trying to see whether their loved ones, their children, their families have been brought in. And then as the time went on, starting to hear of colleagues that lose uh, family members and then starting to lose colleagues you know, Dr. Midhat Saydam, who was a plastic surgeon who was working with us. But one of the one one afternoon, his sister came to the hospital with her children, trying to run away from the bombing in their neighborhood. And he had just said, "Things seem to be under control here. I'm just going to take her to our house because my other siblings are there and my parents are there." 
and he never came back. They bombed that building that he, his whole family was in. And he was killed alongside, along with his parents and his siblings and his sister and her kid. Um, and it, so that was also still before the 17th of October. And then when the 17th of October started, and that is the day the uh, Ahli Baptist Hospital was hit by a missile uh, uh, with 483 killed outright and then others who died from their wounds. That was the big end of the brutal war. I mean, for me, I remember now looking back, realizing that moment, coming out of uh, in, in, in the emergency department at Shifa having uh, 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 transported one of the, uh, you know, the wounded and, and transported the last of the wounded, kind of thinking this is the end of the war and the beginning of genocide. Until then, it was just a very severe, very bad, very cruel war. But then the hospital was bombed for the first time. Uh, and the narrative about Shifa having all of these underground bunkers and the militarization of the health system as a way of justifying the attack. And then after the attack on Ahli, the destruction within a few days of three children's hospitals and then the tanks bombing Al-Quds Hospital, which was run by the Palestine Red Crescent Society. And so realizing that, that, that you know, on the night of the 17th of October, we crossed from a war into a genocide. That's really horrible. And did you, did you also notice that then the, like the type of, like, the type of, of, of wounds and of injuries that you were treating were changing as well? Because there was also the, I, I have to check, the ground war started around then as well, right? So I imagine it's also different types of patients coming in at a different pace probably as well. So what happened once the, the ground invasion happened is we started to see white phosphorus. First, in, pay, in, in, in the wounded escaping the north, so a 13-year-old boy and his father, I remember were the first phosphorus. And I had seen phosphorus burns in Gaza during the 2009 war. Uh, and then again, we saw it when they started to shell uh, Shat at refugee camp. And then as people tried to escape Shat, they fired phosphorus bombs at them. Uh, and then you'd see other weapons, and then you don't understand how the injury happens. And then you start seeing a pattern. So they were using. And, and then in retrospect, realized that that's what they had used at Ahli Baptist Hospital. They were using what's called a, a Hellfire Ninja missile, which is a missile that fragments immediately into discs, metal discs that explode horizontally at the surface and are able to kind of, you know, they're referred to euphemistically as anti-personnel. They create amputations and injuries uh, that are very distinctive. Uh, and then eventually you see, uh, 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 you know, when, when we were towards the end, stuck in, uh, isolated in Ahli Hospital, quadcopters, and these are the small drones with a sniper gun that they would send to the vicinity of the hospital and sometimes into the grounds of the hospital to shoot at people trying to get into the hospital from outside. Uh, and so with each, you know, and because I have had 25 years of experience in, as a war surgeon and because academically, as a researcher, I have an interest in war injuries, um, you see injuries which don't make sense. And then eventually you see them being repeated and then you find out about the weapon. And so it's obvious that, that one of the things that was happening is that there are weapons being tried out and weapons being advertised. We have to understand that one of the... Uh, aims of a Gaza war for the Israeli weapons industry is to research and advertise weapons production. And we see that with the quadcopters, because if you look at the website of the company uh, called Extend that, that manufactures quadcopters, it's now using the, what they call battle-tested products to look for 40 million of uh, 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 dollars in funding to expand the, the, the realm of quadcopters as a result of the success that they've had in this war.
That's so cynical, horrible. Um, I would like to uh, ask a question to uh, Sara, uh, yes. joining us from uh, Arts of Gaza. Uh, I was wondering because, well, of course, you got the how you got like uh, people such as Hassan and other like uh, people providing information to you as a healthcare professional from Gaza. Um, so, how did how did uh, Arts of Gaza come across? Um, well, it actually started with a group that was already active with uh, providing help and medical relief in cases of catastrophes and wars, uh, amongst other uh, during the earthquake in, in Turkey. Uh, and then when Gaza happened, there were some people, some doctors that said, well, you know, this is one of the things that falls within our expertise. What could we do to help? Um, and there wasn't really a space to talk about it. It was very quickly shut down um, and put aside as, well, it's complicated and um, let's skip this one. Uh, and so a, a group of, uh, of that decided to branch out on their own and created um, uh, Doctors for Gaza. Uh, and it has now grown to a couple of hundred active members with not only doctors, but also nurses and pharmacists. Um, and uh, over 5,000 followers on, on uh, social media. And what we are trying to do is, from our perspective as healthcare workers here, see how we can help. And our first instinct would be to uh, bring people and bring materials, but due to the circumstances, it's impossible to get anything in. So the next step then is advocacy. Uh, which means using our voices as healthcare providers to say healthcare is not a target, to say uh, the, the, the attacks that are now being seen uh, uh, in Gaza is something we've never seen before, is a complete breach of international humanitarian law. And we as doctors, we as medics, will call that out again and again and again. Uh, and calling for a ceasefire, calling for the respect of healthcare facility according to international law, and uh, hopefully one day for the uh, rebuilding of the uh, healthcare sector, because the healthcare sector has been brought to his knees with 25 hospitals completely destroyed, uh, annihilated, over 100 uh, ambulances. Uh, targeted, not by carpet bombing, but very precise bombing, despite the fact that every single time that a hospital goes out, um, they provide their location to the army. Um, and that means that there were entire regions of, of, of Gaza, and still now, that are inaccessible uh, for ambulances, which means that while the hostilities go on, there are people left to die on the side of the road or stuck behind um, uh, behind rubble uh, that could otherwise have been saved. Thank you. So, uh, Hassan, this type of, of movements uh, in countries uh, throughout the world, because I think this also this type of organization uh, also was happening in other countries. Yes. What is that important for the people for the for the healthcare professionals in Gaza? Do they feel that as a as a sign of solidarity? Do they how do how, how do they react to that, or is it just like they are not, they're completely isolated of the world and don't really notice this. No, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I remember in being in Shifa when the first uh, uh, demonstration, major demonstration happened in London and, and the relief that it brought that you're, you know, you're, Israel tries to create this death world that you inhabit. Uh, and and you suddenly hear about the rest of the world reaching out, and we saw how people received the news about the student movement and the student encampments in Europe and, and North America. People in, in Rafah and and you know them writing messages back to the students on their tents so that the students can can feel that. Absolutely, it's that sense of isolation uh, and being completely bereft that the Israelis try to enforce on people in Gaza. And they're doing that now. You know, the first thing that they did is to send a tank to have its photo opportunity taken inside the Rafah border to give the Palestinians the message that they're, they're her hermetically sealed from the outside world and that there's nothing that's going to reach. And, and the critical component about these movements. And these, you know, movements these movements, particularly with regards to healthcare, 
have also been driven by the fact that there is official collusion from the official or the quasi-official uh, medical establishment. You know, I don't know the situation in, in Holland, but I'm sure that it's not much better than the UK. But in the UK, uh, uh, the Royal Colleges uh, of Surgeons or Physicians or Pediatricians or Psychiatrists have remained eerily silent. When members, Palestinian members of these Royal Colleges, uh, were killed. At best, all we can do was getting a bland statement that mourns the death of Dr. Ahmed Maqadme, who was in the Royal College of Surgeons, as if he was run over by a car or had a, 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 an accident. Uh, and the British Medical Association, which is supposed to be the union, is refusing to put pressure on the, on the Israeli Medical Association because for the fact that the Israeli Medical Association is allowing its members to participate in the torture and the forced medical treatment of Palestinian detainees in Israeli prison, you know, detainees from Gaza, uh, and has not censored over 150 Israeli doctors who, who, who wrote and signed a petition at the beginning of the war calling on the Israeli army to bomb Shifa hospital because it's a base for Hamas. So, you know, these groups are an alternative to what, you know, I, I refer to as genocide enablers, institutions and individuals within health profession whose job has been to ensure that the, the voices of the victims are never heard, the witnesses are, sil are silent, and that the genocide can continue unhindered. Thank you. So, Sarah, did this type of collision or this, well, you already described that there was a certain amount of uh, discomfort, let's put it like that, but did you, f did you, do you have the impression that there's also this type of collision or? Um, we have a situation where there is a difference between the healthcare workers and the healthcare organizations. And the healthcare organizations so far have not taken a stance or if they have, it's been uh, a very bland kind of statement, like, oh, well, it's all for what's happening to both parties. Um, and I, I think that people don't quite realize that when they're saying it's all for what's happening to both parties, what they're actually saying is that um, a Palestinian life is worth so much less than an Israeli life. Because if, if we look just at, at numbers, for every child that was killed on the 7th of October, Israel has killed over 450 children. So when institutions or people, and even some friends of mine, with the best of intentions say it's very bad on both sides, they're saying that one Israeli child that's died is just as much of a drama, just as deserves as much attention, outrage, empathy, as 450 Palestinian children. That is what you're saying every single time you're saying both sides. Um, and, and what we are saying is we're saying, no, no, we need to talk, we need to treat first what kills first. And the ones that are being killed first are Palestinians, are healthcare workers. We have over 500 healthcare workers that have been died. We have a huge amount of healthcare workers that have been arrested and tortured. Some of them have told their stories, like Dr. Marouf, a pediatrician who was tortured for 45 days to the point that he wished for death and lost 25 kilos in that time because they starved him. And the day after his release, not knowing whether his children and his wife were still alive, he went back to work to help the children of Gaza. And we, uh, we have a hidden story of uh, doctors that refused to abandon their patients that were taken prisoner by the IDF, tortured, and died while prisoner. We are hearing stories from Israeli doctor colleagues that are sounding the alarm that the torture is so widespread that it has now become routine to perform amputation on previously completely healthy people because their hands and their feet are bound 24 seven for weeks and months on end. That's a situation we're in. And um, if this were happening in any other part of the world, 
I cannot imagine that we would have let it come this far as an international community without condemning this in the strongest term, having severe sanction and probably even military action. Uh, so I think that there, that's why it's important that we uh, here in Europe can be the voices for those people that are not given a voice. One of the doctors that we were in contact with at the Nasser Hospital, um, one of his last voicemail before he fell off the radar, he said, I hope I get to see my daughter one last time. And he said, I hope we do not get forgotten. The biggest fear is because a lot of people have almost even accepted they're going to die. But the fear is that it will be just another bleep on the radar and we will go on with life as it was before and they will be forgotten. And we do not know what became of him and his other colleagues. He might be one of the 50 corpses that was found in the mouse graves of Nasser Hospital. Uh, or he might be one of the doctors that is still now being tortured. It's horrible. Uh, yeah, this, this selective indignation is probably something, Hassan, that must frustrate you very much when you, for example, saw what the, the, the indignation throughout the world when the world's central ki kitchen uh, workers uh, had been targeted and killed. How did you look at the way the world reacted then? One of the most difficult things to come to terms with is that had Israel killed 15,000 puppies or kittens rather than 15,000 Palestinian children, the outrage within, uh, 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 let's say, Western communities would have been deafening. It, literally, if you just imagine Putin deciding to kill 15,000 kittens or 15,000 puppies, the reaction would have been versus 15,000 Palestinian children. I think we have to accept that part of the problem is the racialization of Palestinians, uh, which makes them ungrievable. The racialization of people from the Southern Hemisphere, brown people, Arabs, Muslims, has made Palestinian children ungrievable in the eyes of big sectors of uh, society and less grievable in the eyes of other sectors of society. And so not totally ungrievable, but less grievable. And so what happened is the, 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 the insulting thing about the outrage in the central kitchen uh, attack is, is it reinforced this idea that Israel has been, had been killing health providers, uh, uh, UN workers, uh, 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 humanitarian workers throughout this whole war. It then killed uh, seven or eight uh, white uh, health care workers, and suddenly there's an outrage, and then it becomes a crisis. And then the crisis is very quickly swept under the carpet with the with the collusion of the NGO that sent them. Uh, uh, um, so you kind of move on, uh, and and that's what Israel does. It creates a crisis as a tester for, uh, for a campaign. So you hit Lali Hospital, which is run by the World Council of Churches and run out of the, the, um, the Anglican Church in the UK. And then you see, and then you see the reaction. And if the action is all right, then you roll out the program. You torture Dr. Adnan al Bursh, the, the, the head of orthopedics at Shifa Hospital, to death. You kill him. And you choose someone who had been trained in the UK with connections to the outside world, and then you'd just wait and, and 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 see what the reaction is. And if the reaction is is okay, then you start eliminating these doctors as part of a program to kind of wipe out and uh, all of the witnesses to a lot of the crimes that have happened. You you and you do that again with with you know the 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 attacks on, on, um, on humanitarian uh, workers, and then you see whether there's a reaction, and then you stop for it. That's why there were no more attacks after the reaction to the healthcare, the, the central kitchen. Uh, uh, you, you, these are not random acts of uncontrolled violence. These are litmus tests to the resolve of the international community 
for specific incidents. So let's let's have a look at your your role, Hassan, in um, in testifying for the ICC case, uh, because well, the story has been that that might have played a role in uh, yeah forces trying to uh, keep you out of uh, of the Schengen area. How did you like? Was this this was probably not the first time you you had some some issues uh, moving around or speaking up? Can you tell us a little bit about the the, the difficulties you encountered to uh, make your voice heard, and uh, and move around, please? So, the the harassment started while I was still in Gaza. Uh, uh, within a few days of me being in Gaza and appearing. Uh, uh, on some media outlets, the anti-terrorist police came and harassed my family here and asked really uh, uh, uninnocent questions. Uh, you know, asked my wife which room I was in, sleeping in, in Shifa Hospital, and which department. And if if she was shown a diagram, would she be able to tell where in Shifa Hospital I am? Uh, uh, and then when I came out, there is a kind of you know the usual campaign by organizations like UK Lawyers for Israel and by the right-wing press and by pro-Israeli newspapers like the, the Jewish Chronicle. And then uh, uh, I had an invitation to speak at this Congress in Berlin. I arrived in Berlin and uh, was told by the authorities, both verbally and in writing, that I'm not allowed to go into Germany for the month of April. And uh, this was confirmed by documents that the, they gave me. And I was sent back from Germany. And then uh, I, there was the, the engagement to speak at the French Senate at, at the invitation of, of senators uh, had been pre-planned. And I went to France really had, having no idea that there was a Schengen wine ban. At Charles de Gaulle, I was told by the, the passport officer that there, the Germans had put in an administrative Schengen wide ban for me to enter any country in the Schengen. And because it's an administrative ban, which had been brought in, and I remember it, I, it had been brought in to manage football hooligans trying to move from one, um, one uh, 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 match to the other. They didn't have to inform me, they didn't have to show it to a judge, and that only the German government can remove the ban, but that different governments had the right to create an exception for their own country in defense of their own sovereign. And so by the end of the day, it had become apparent to myself and the, the, the French parliamentarian that the French government was not going to create a, um, a, an exception. Uh, I then was sent back to, to London. And then you realize that, uh, and then, the issue of traveling to Holland came up because that would already also pre-planned and I was supposed to be at the Palestinian embassy on the 15th of March and then speaking to parliamentarians and speaking to yourselves. I had a meeting with the head of the UN agency for chemical weapons to discuss the, the, the use of, of white phosphorus. And the, the Dutch foreign ministry informed the Palestine uh, ambassador that there was no they, they had no intention of lifting the ban. Uh, and therefore, that was... Um, luckily, um, the, the lawyers in Germany, Alexander Gorski and the European Center for uh, Legal Support, uh, had managed to overturn... You know, the minute the ban was shown to a judge, it was overturned. Um, and then it, you realize that, that actually, you know, the the body the, the body of the brown man is the border in Europe, not 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 the 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 geographical borders that you know. Fortress Europe is made out of where the bodies lie, not where the where the topography lies on the map. Uh, and 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 that this struggle between those who wish a Europe that is open and where there's freedom of expression, freedom of movement. Versus those who who uh, who uh, who uh, long for a racialized uh, um, fortress Europe. Your sound is dropping a little bit. You might have uh, oh. issues with your with your computer. With <laughs> my mic, yeah, uh, my or mic. maybe be low on battery on your headphones. I don't know. Yeah. Um, 
do you expect more uh, barriers for you to uh, to move around and to speak your uh, yeah your testimony because you have an important voice you were there in the first days of uh, of of course of the of the, well when the destruction started and you have apparent you have important testimony about cluster munition white phosphorus that is really relevant in terms when when it comes to legal proceedings against Israel in uh, and what 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 are you what are your expectations oh this is the, the 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 campaign will continue uh, the campaign will continue um organizations involved in what they call lawfare like uk lawyers for israel uh are you know are they are a continuation of the israeli security establishment and and they use the courts to try to do everything from have you barred from the charity commission uh, uh, from holding any kind of office in a, a charitable organization to going after doctors and having their medical licenses uh, uh, revoked. So the, 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 the battle will continue because 76 years of total impunity has been shattered. And it's that impunity that intoxicated the Israeli leaders at the beginning of this war to openly verbalize their genocidal intention as set out in the ICJ by the South African team. You know, it, they, they had been drunk on that 76 years of total impunity afforded to them by Europe and North America, that they told us that they wanted to wipe out people in Gaza, that they want to ethnically cleanse Gaza, that they want to drop a nuclear bomb on Gaza, that this is the Nakba too. All of these things that we heard being catalogued by the South Africa team uh, uh, are as a result of that impunity that now has been shattered. You know, as Palestinians, none of this surprises us. It's just that the world is listening for the first time. And that is what's terrifying Western governments and the pro-Israel lobby within these Western governments. And that's why we saw the brutality in Amsterdam, Amsterdam University by the police, We've seen it in, 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 by the French police against the students. And that's why 2,200 uh, students in the United States have been in prison, more than when China cracked down on the student movement in Hong Kong, more than any other student revolution in the globe. There have been more students because suddenly that complete control of the narrative has been shattered. And therefore, these uh, powers that have been used to that complete control of the narrative and being able to give Israel its impunity. Because we need to understand that the impunity is not intrinsic in Israel because of just the nature of Israel and its history. It's intrinsic for the reasons that the Colombian president said uh, when, when he voiced his support to, to, to the Palestinian people. What is being done to Gaza is a message to people in the Southern Hemisphere across the globe that if you try to change the rules of engagement, this is what will be done to you. That, that, that he said that this, Gaza is being made an example of to frighten the rest of us. Yeah, that's a, that's a bleak analysis, but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the Arts for Gaza people, the Doctors for Gaza people, I mean, do they like encounter like similar, I mean, this is an extreme case probably of, 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 of suppression of rights, but how is, do they encounter? Can I just say 63, 63 doctors are under investigation by the General Medical Council to have their licenses withdrawn. In Britain. This is not an extreme, in Britain. This wow. is not an extreme case. Oh. A similar process has been happening to junior doctors in the United States and in, in, in Canada, where people have been thrown out of their re, uh, jobs, put on forced administrative leave, uh, just, all, just based on just voicing support to, to Palestinians uh, in, on social media. It's not, but suddenly the world is seeing it. And that's what makes the difference. Yeah, thank you for, for clarifying that. It's incredible because in the case of Ukraine, I think nobody had a problem with doctors voicing their... How is it in, Nether in the Netherlands, Sarah? Well, I think it's, it's especially Ukraine makes it the... Because it's so recent 
And uh, it was very blatant that for when there was Ukraine, uh, all the medical societies uh, voiced their support. When there was Ukraine, there were hospitals that showed the uh, flag of, U of Ukraine on their buildings to show their support. And there was this very clear outcry of principle, like we as human beings and as doctors cannot condone this and we, we, we hope for a swift end of these atrocities. And there's this very weird situation where um, we have a situation that is 40 times worse than Ukraine ever was. I mean, th there's really no comparison. Uh, and yet, if you just say I'm against genocide, uh, uh, I'm against uh, the attacks on healthcare workers, I'm against the, the massive killing of children, there's been more children killed than in the last four years in the entire world, all the conflicts of the world combined in four years is, is, is less children dead than now in seven months in Gaza. I mean, this is, this is really something that we've not seen in our lifetimes. And yet we see that there's a lot of pushback, a lot of uh, avoidance, uh, a lot of uh, accusations. We see that very much online, that uh, um, accusation of, oh, well, do you support Hamas then? Do you, are you anti-Semitic? Just like the, the classic Pavlov uh, conditioning that, that, that's been going on for a while. Um, and it's, it's apparently something very hard to get out from. And I think that people don't realize, uh, and institutions don't realize that the long-term um, uh, consequences of not standing up for principles. Because what it's showing to the world is it was never about the principle, it's about the people. And when the victims were white and blonde and Christian, we have no problems uh, as doctors taking position. And the same organization that uh, took position for Ukraine say, now well, it's too political, we don't do politics, so we cannot take a position for that. And it very much reminded me of, um, of a bit by Trevor Noah that talked about the social contract that we have as a society. Uh, and that's when the people in power do not respect their own principles, it breaks the social contract and it breaks the fabric of society in a way. That's a, that sounds like a, a good analysis. Uh, Hassan, we will not take too much more of your time because you are a very, very, very busy man. <laughs> Though I hope you will be able to uh, to stick uh, stick around a bit more. But I would would like to ask you one final, my, perhaps a big question. But will you be going back to Gaza? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, no one has the right to stop me from going to Gaza. I have the duty of care towards my patient and towards my people to serve them. I have a particular uh, uh, I don't know what dramatically to say it. The, the duty is heightened by the fact that I have over 25 years of experience in war surgery, that I, I academically uh, have a, 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 an interest in war injuries and therefore, uh, my experience over those years uh, uh, would come in um, much use, and and therefore I will be going back. Uh, um, the minute Rafah opened, I you know I was here for uh, to support my family. My kids are going through kind of milestone exams this year, so one of the reasons I came out is I didn't want to have them worry about me while they were trying to sit these exams and and. But once these exams are done, I'm, I'm going back to Gaza. Now, a friend of mine joked that, you know, if they won't let you into Berlin, do you really think they'll let you into Gaza? But we'll see. We'll, we, will, we will not self-censor. We will push forward until we are stopped. Thank you so much, Hassan, uh, Dr. Hassan Abusita, for joining us, uh, for sharing your testimony with us, but also for like 
speaking up and also for your incredible courage in yeah, doing your profession under most difficult of circumstances uh, to be with your people, but in the end, it's our people, right? We are all people. Uh, and it's, uh, it's so beautiful that we could have you here. And uh, I would like to thank you very much. And also Sara for doing a bit of, yeah, it feels a bit like an extension of a, like, a, like a social contract between all healthcare workers and doctors worldwide, right? To speak the truth about what's happening there and that we have to take care of, of our humanity. And this is a very important and beautiful way of doing it. So thank you very much for your bravery, your courage and your work. Thank you so much. So I'm very happy to, uh, to invite uh, our next guest on stage. Uh, it has been, uh, well, I already, I, when I was thinking about what can we do to make a bridge between the two uh, panels, um, I thought we need something, well, a bit light. Uh, not, uh, not denying the heaviness of, of the topics we're talking about, but we need to, we shouldn't forget that uh, besides being victims of great injustice and terrible violence, besides being freedom fighters, Palestinians are also people leading normal lives under not normal circumstances. And then I came across, or actually a very good uh, Palestinian poet uh, advised me, you should go and have a look at the videos of Sophie Khatib. Sophie is a public speaker and uh, a storyteller, and he tells stories about normal life, uh, but also always on the back, with the backdrop of Palestinian life and of occupation and Nakba and the memory of longing for a place uh, you're not always, uh, you're not uh, able to uh, return to. Um, so we are now going from Gaza to uh, Haifa and Jerusalem, and I would like to uh, invite uh, Sophie on stage to tell his story, which is called Onions. Sophie, please giving him a round of applause. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, what a difficult mission I have now. Uh, just to clarify, I'm not a comedian, so the goal is not to make you laugh but I hope I will make you smile. Uh, I would just would like to have an answer to a question before I start. How many of you like onions? Oh, wow, we have uh, a big audience of onions lovers, great. I hope I will give you more reasons to like onions. So, the story starts actually about 15 years ago when I was much younger, as I was 23, and I was on my way to a protest. When I was told, stop, what's in the bag? Onions. Mm. Okay, pass. Little they knew that was onion for illegal purposes. I took the onions to a demonstration in the back lines of that demonstration. In that protest, my role was to be the onion guy. For those who don't know much about this, my name is Subhi. I'm from Palestine. I was born in Nazareth. My dad is part-time carpenter. My mom is not Mary. And I get confused sometimes because of the beard. But one of the things we can do is to protest sometimes. And whenever we want to protest, we always will start, there will always be the beating, but then sometimes will be some tear gas and sometimes bullet with rubber and then other things. But as an onion guy, your role is basically to be in the back lines when the tear gas started being dropped, and then someone would pass this person who was affected by the tear gas to the back lines to reach the onion people 
and you will be in a station. And that's how I met Ifrat. So I was basically in one of those stations and people will be like coming and they cannot really see, like the, the, the tear gas just like burns your eyes that you cannot see and it just burns. And one of the things you can do is you cut the onion and freshly you give it to the person and they just put it very close to their nose and eyes and that makes the burn a bit less. And so I was there on my mission and I was doing my job when Aya handed me Ifrat and she said, take care of her. And Ifrat, I just handed her the onion like any other person. And she's like, who are you? Who are you? You know, with like, I'm like, Subhi. Oh. And I was like, when I heard her speaking, it was Arabic, but with an Ashkenazi accent. So I was, and what's, what's your name? Who are you? Ifrat. Oh, I heard about you from Yara and Bakri. She's like, yeah, yeah, oh, you're that Subhi. Okay, do you have a cigarette? Yeah, sure. I lighted the cigarette and I gave it to her. And we started talking. Ifrat is my height with this blonde hair that is a bit curly. And we started talking about what's happening in the protest now. And it was literally a blind date, from one side at least. And we continued like talking and discussing on what's happening here. And then slowly, slowly, the heat of the protest was going down. And then we moved to a cafe in Haifa. And in Haifa, you sit there, and all the other people who were joining those protests will come. And you will have the different figures. You will have the angry Majd, who's just talking about how horrible those security forces were and what they did. And you have Yara who talks about like the heroism of this person and that person and how we all like stood together and we could do this and could do that. And you find everyone is just like engaging and you see their characters so amplified, sometimes with the alcohol as well and with the cigarettes and with the shouting. But you also see people like me and Ifrat who are engaging in those conversations, but also looking at each other's eyes and smiling a bit, knowing that there is a bond that is getting formed. And this bond is stronger than onion, but that's not like something to be said here. It's, it's more about really like how you have all of those gatherings, just building those connections and relations. A few years later, I got to know Elena in a garlic event, but that's another story. <laughs> and with Elena, we moved to Jerusalem. And before moving to Jerusalem, one of the things that I remember from my talks with Efrat was how much she hated Jerusalem. She was born in Jerusalem, but she said how much she couldn't handle it. And I have visited Jerusalem up to that point a few times. I didn't really like it, but I didn't have anything against it. And I didn't understand why she was so much against Jerusalem. So when I moved with Elena to Jerusalem, I started understanding a bit. We moved to the middle, the green line. And this is one of the things that you don't really notice when you look at maps. You know, you look at the map and you see the line and this is the west and this is the east. But we don't really look into the zooming in into a map and see that there are houses on those lines. So the house that we were living in was on the green line. It was one of those houses also that didn't really have an address really, uh, which made it hard for pizza deliveries. But it was really one of those places where you are in a place where it's really difficult to know where do you belong and how are you situated. Jerusalem for me was a hard place to, to be in, not only because of the tension and of the occupation that is more into your face than in Haifa, but because of my job. So I was working there with UNRWA. And my job was 
to document the violations that happens in Palestinians' lives because of the wall, because of the separation wall that was there. And going through houses and, and asking people, so how is your life? And they're like, well, it's horrible, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, but I need details you know, for the report. And they will start telling you details. And I was just crying the first few days of every single thing I'm hearing. I'm a Palestinian, and I have been through a lot, and I learned human rights, and I know about many violations, but when you start meeting people and hearing every single story and every single thing, and you're writing it down, and you know, cannot do anything except just documenting it, you just fill up. But unfortunately, also with that comes the kind of like the resilient or something that makes your protection layer thicker. You're like, okay, I have seen this, I know this. But in one of the times, I was in, in this house where I was asking people about what they're suffering from. And it was a common thing that they were telling because they are basically Palestinians who were in the Israeli side of the wall, but they're Palestinian with a green ID, which means they are from the West Bank, which also meant that they are illegally in Israel. But Israel put them in there. But they need a permit to be in their own house, but that permit needs also to give them like the exact street where they need to walk to go to the West Bank. So you live here, and you have a street, and let's say there's a school here, or there's a supermarket here. You are not allowed to cross the street for those, because you will be doing something illegal to your permit. So you need to go around next to the wall until the next checkpoint to cross. And people were always like, you know, treating me with respect as someone coming with this like, you know, official UN car and this official you know, reports and questions. But in that case, there was this child in the room who disregarded like this formal me. And he was very much asking his mom, when are you cooking psachan? And, and he's like, wait, wait, we're, you know, we have some important guest here, we finished and then. And, and he really wanted that msachan. Msachan, for those who don't know it, it's basically layers of bread with a lot of some maq and a lot of onions and a bit of chicken and thymes. And that child was waiting for that dish and I understood that my presence might delay his pleasure so I should leave. And I kind of like wrapped it up and I was about to go the Mother was telling her child, I'm sorry, we cannot do it today. Uh, your dad is, is, uh, is away in Ramallah and he cannot make it before the evening and uh, we don't have onions. You're seeing it coming. <laughs> and, and the child was like, yeah, but can't we just like, you know, go? And his mom like, no, 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 we cannot, we cannot cross the road. That's, that's impossible cannot do that, we're risking basically being kicked out of our house to the West Bank. So no. And then the child looked at me as like, what about him? <laughs> and I looked back and I'm like, uh, okay. And so I was on a mission again, and I went to that supermarket, which is, Ironic, like, you know, how such a simple thing becomes such a big thing. I just crossed the road, and I went to the supermarket, and I bought onions. And funnily, when I was about to cross, a soldier stopped me. Stop. What's in the bag? Onions. Little than you, it was illegally smuggled. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Beautiful story. It made me laugh, actually. <laughs> Not only smile. 
and moussakhan is one of my favorite dishes. So <laughs> thanks so much uh, for this uh, moment to uh, yeah, have a bit of air.